Okay, we're about to get started. Good evening. This is Chairwoman Makita Scott. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education for Tuesday, October 12th, 2021. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Mr. Thomas. We will then have a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held both in person and by phone by board members and streamed online through Microsoft Teams and broadcasted through BCPS TV, Comcast, Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item, excuse me, yes, the first item on the agenda is the consideration of the October 12th agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I'm not aware of any changes or uh, additions to tonight's agenda. Thank you. Okay, if none, hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, and eight, consult with staff, consultants, or other individuals about pending or potential litigation. The minutes of the closed session and informal summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that, I call on Ms. Anderson. <clears throat> Good evening, Chairwoman Scott, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters. Retirements. Any questions? Resignations. Any questions? No. Leaves. Any questions? No. Certificated appointments. Any questions? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D1 through D4? So moved, Mac. Second, Offerman. Is there any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Cosby? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Yes. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Motion carries. <clears throat> the next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that, I call on Dr. Williams. Madam Chair, members of the board, I am bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval. Assistant Principal, Pretty Boy Elementary School. Assistant Principal, Westchester Elementary School. Human Resources Office, Office of Staffing. Specialist, Title I in the Office of Title I. And Supervisor, the Office of World Languages and ESOL. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit E1? So moved, Mac. Second, Mac. Thank you. Any discussion? Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Crosby? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. McGillian? Yes. Yes. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Yes. Yes. Dr. Yes. Mr. Yes. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. 
So our first appointment is Tiffany Cole as the specialist in Title I in the Office of Title I. Let me see if we have a picture. There we are. Thank you. We want to say welcome to Baltimore County Public Schools. She's coming uh, from Baltimore City Public Schools. Her uh, current job is the principal at Utah Marshburn Elementary School. She served as a resident principal, educational associate, teacher, instructional support, and Title I specialist in Baltimore City Public Schools. She also served as a mathematics instructional support teacher at Samuel Coleridge Taylor Elementary School in Baltimore City, as well as a classroom. Congratulations, Tiffany Cole. Let's acknowledge Tiffany. Our next appointment is Ashley B. McCarthy to supervisor in the Office of World and World Languages and ESOL. She brings to us eight years of service. Currently, she served as the specialist in the Office of World Languages, as well as a resource teacher in the Office of World Languages. She also served as a Spanish teacher at Franklin Middle School. Muy bueno. Welcome, Ms. McCarthy. Congratulations. Next, we have Jenna M. McCray as the assistant principal at Westchester Elementary School. She brings to us about seven years of experience. She was the classroom teacher at Catonsville Elementary School and as at Woodhome Elementary School. Congratulations, Jenna M. McCray. <laughs> Next, we have Fong Nguyen as the Human Resources Officer in the Office of Staffing. Welcome to Baltimore County Public Schools. He's coming from Prince George's County where he served as the Human Resources Partner, Human Resources Junior Partner, and Human Resources Assistant, all in Prince George's County Public Schools. Welcome, Mr. Nguyen. <laughs> Next, we have Jeffrey L. Tesser as the assistant principal at Pretty Boy Elementary School. He brings to us 16 years of experience where currently he served as a supervisor in related services in the Office of Related Services. Previously, he served as an assistant principal, principal, assistant principal, classroom teacher, and special ed teacher all in Baltimore County Public Schools. Congratulations, Mr. Tesser. That concludes the appointment. Great, thank you. Great, thank you, and welcome to everyone. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. The Board of Education will conduct the public comment portion of the meeting by allowing those who register to speak to attend in person. Registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Speakers were selected randomly using an electronic selection process from all registrations received within the designated time frame. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. Of course, if fewer than 10 registrations are received, all who registered will be permitted to speak. However, no substitutions will be allowed. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper form to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask that speakers observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the tone or see that time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time, and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters, or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, 
The public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under Board of Education Participation by the Public. So we will first have our um, stakeholders speak. And our first stakeholder is Cindy Sexton from TABCO. Good evening, Chairwoman Scott, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Since I began my role as TABCO president, I have continually brought the topic of educator retention to this board. I have shared the costs of onboarding new educators and the money lost when an educator leaves the profession, especially in the middle of a school year. One common theme in the loss of these educators is the workload. And are we ever hearing about workload concerns this year? The overwhelming need is for increased staffing and filling the current vacancies, but we all know there is a national teacher shortage with no easy solution in sight. At the last board meeting, TEBCO board member Bev Fokoff spoke around the concerns of our school counselors. I'm also hearing regularly from special educators trying to complete documentation for comp services. They are being paid for work beyond their duty day, but for many, they want their time. Time with family, time to decompress, time, an educator's most precious commodity. Our nurses are wearing many hats and serving our students, but they too don't have enough time to safely and effectively do the, all they are being asked to do. Our classroom educators have large class sizes and resource teachers, paraeducators, and other support staff are being pulled for coverages and substituting. The problem compounds. We all know this. We have had conversations with Dr. Williams and his cabinet about it, and we know, again, there are no easy answers. But since I only have three minutes, I can't speak to all the concerns I've heard from all the members, but they are calling, emailing, and texting with all the challenges that this school year brings. But I wanna speak right now to our newest educators. This is a hard job. This job will simultaneously break your heart and fill your heart with overwhelming joy. We need you and we want you, and your students need and want you. Please don't give up. Reach out to your fellow educators, your TABCO building rep, me. BCPS has supports for you and TABCO has supports for you. Be sure to use all that's available. And to all of our educators, TABCO does hear your concerns. Our action teams and work groups are meeting regularly and then elevating concerns and solutions to BCPS leadership in regular meetings. We are all working to keep our educators because our students are so important. This year isn't easy because teaching isn't easy. A kindergarten teacher once said, I work harder and care more than I ever thought possible. That's a teacher for sure, giving their all. But to all the educators out there, we know how hard this is and thank you for all you do. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Mr. Billy Burke in case. Good evening, Chairwoman Scott, Superintendent Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of CASE. There are a few issues deeply impacting morale and the running of schools. Teacher vacancies, bus driver vacancies, additional adult assistant vacancies, substitute vacancies, and special education staffing are at the core of most problems administrators are dealing with every day. Vacancies are negatively impacting instruction. Vacancies are negatively impacting how long our children wait for the bus. Vacancies are negatively impacting behavior. Vacancies are causing longer than reasonable work hours. The current narrative is that BCPS is having a problem finding people to work. The actual narrative should be that BCPS is having trouble finding people to work for low wages. Raise the wages and the outcomes will change. AFSCME in Anne Arundel County is asking for a $5 an hour raise for all of its employees, 
And I think that actually happened today. You won't be able to stop AFSCME employees from leaving BCPS. And if we've learned anything during the pandemic, it's that AFSCME and ESPBC employees are the hidden lifeline of this organization. Board members often ask what they can do to help. Change how long it takes to make a decision. Change how long it takes to change or create a contract. We've got to stop doing things the way they've always been done. Raise the pay for teachers. Raise the pay for bus drivers and attendants. Raise the pay and provide benefits for additional adult assistance and make them part of ESPBC. Provide an IEP facilitator or chairperson for every elementary school. BCPS spends over $30 million a year in non-public placements. Our teachers and programs have the skills to serve those students, but there are not enough teachers and case managers to provide the appropriate level of service. It might seem strange that as the executive director of CASE, I'm pleading for improvements for other bargaining units. But if you improve things for these members, things will improve for CASE members, and ultimately, they will improve for students. One final thought. I've mentioned before that we need to support the emotional health of our employees, but don't misunderstand me. Staff learning how to take care of themselves and their students is important, but it won't fix the problems we are having. Fixing the problems can't be placed on the backs of staff. Fixing the problems will require structural change from the top, from you. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Next, next is Mr. Bash Farone. Good evening to all. I'm Dr. Farron, the chair of the Central Area Educational Council. The Central Area Council had its monthly meeting Wednesday, October 6. About 14 persons attended. Here is the summary. We discussed that BCPS needs for rebuilding some facilities, repairing others, maintaining others, and also the operational budget are enormous and that we are receiving from the state and the county not enough to meet the demands. Although our first task is to represent our central area, however, I and the members of the Central Area Council believe that all BCPS area schools' needs must be met. We are all one team. The Central Area Council members are dedicated and energetic members who are full-time employees and business persons. We have difficulties in implementing our duties because we have no access to the emails of teachers, parents, students, and we have no resources. Therefore, our quality meetings are attended by a dozen at each time. The central area feels we can do better. The central area requests that the Board of Education to consider adding in the operational budget 2023 for the central area to have administrative support for emails, posters, coffee, orange juice, fruits, cookies for our meetings. We also ask that you would include small amount, but respectable honorarium for invited speakers. I think this is really bare minimum. We request that the Board of Education also explain to the public, to us and the public, to why our request for the needs of all county schools are not really being met. I have been here for more than 20 years. It's the same story every year. 
And I really don't understand why our schools are not getting enough money for all our schools. I don't. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Ms. Julie miller breeds gifted and talented. Good evening, Chair Scott, board members, Dr. Williams, and the BCPS community. It is my pleasure to speak to you tonight as the immediate past chair of the GTCAC. Dr. Zamira Simpkins, our new chair, has gotten our group off to a great start and hopes to be able to speak at a BOE meeting soon. We've already had our first two virtual meetings for the year and are actively planning more. Please look us up at bcpsgtcac at wordpress.com to find out more. As the saying goes, actions speak louder than words. And as someone who has been talking a lot over these last many years about the same things repeatedly, we are thrilled to say we are finally seeing action on many fronts. We have advocated for over a decade for BCPS to institute the use of a cognitive assessment to increase objectivity and decrease underrepresentation in the identification of GT students. And that is finally beginning this November as part of the universal screening process. We have been pushing for BCPS to develop stronger acceleration procedures, and with Dr. Williams' support, there is now a group who is actively working on this. We are in conversations to examine if BCPS could expand eligibility for early kindergarten for those young children who are ready. There is a group actively working with the Office of Advanced Academics to forward face items from the AAGT handbook, something parents and group members have long thought necessary. It also aligns with recommendation 1-4 made in the recent efficiency review to create a listing um, to existing procedural manuals and handbooks with hot links. We also have a group member who will be representing the GTCAC as part of the stakeholder groups that Dr. Williams is forming to respond to and work through the efficiency review. BCPS is also doing internal work, as evidenced by its strategic improvement team on honors, AP, GT, and IB. We believe this kind of programmatic review is very important and have for years asked BCPS to perform both internal and external evaluations of the GT program. Having measurable goals as defined by the SIT will be a step in the right direction and also responds to the efficiency review's recommendations that key performance indicators be created for the COMPASS goals. We see that on the strategic plan data dashboard, there are metrics related to the goal of closing the gap between student groups in the AAGT program. Additionally, the September 16th Equity Committee meeting was spent almost entirely on the AAGT program and was truly excellent. Long-standing and complicated issues coalesced clearly while looked at through the equity lens. Issues with the overall numbers of students in GT, how to improve representation among student groups using COGAT, data to help inform future practices and potential curricular revisions were all discussed. Looking forward to the future, we encourage BCPS to continue inviting and engaging with the GTCAC so we may continue the work that is necessary to make sure the AHGT program is working for all students. We ask that as BCPS looks to the future, it is also clear about how much work has already been done through the Office of Advanced Academics. Wade Kearns, the coordinator, and the four resource teachers have a wealth of knowledge and practice that must be maintained to keep the AHGT program moving on the right path. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next is general public comment, and our first speaker is Ms. Sharon Seraf. Good evening, everyone. I would like to discuss three important terms that are centerpieces of special education. FAPE, free and appropriate public education. Free means that there is no cost to the family to receive services. Appropriate. What works for one student may not work for another. Public education, I think these two words speak for themselves. Second term, IEP, Individual Education Plan. The accent here is on the word individual because the education plan needs to meet the unique needs of each child. LRE, Least Restrictive Environment. 
This refers to the environment in which the services are provided. We tend to think it is best for all students to learn in person in the general education environment. However, we need to remember the focus of special education is the individual. And where does that individual best learn without producing harmful effects? From what I've seen and experienced during the first few weeks of the school year, BCPS has forgotten the meaning of these three important terms. Forcing a child into an environment that increases that child's anxiety is not providing FAPE. By not allowing students with disabilities into the virtual learning program, we are not providing FAPE, and that's still happening. Providing instruction to students through work packets printed from Schoology while a child is quarantined is not providing FAPE. Requiring a student to attend general education class when they clearly are dealing with significant behaviors and communication concerns is not providing FAPE. These are all examples of how BCPS is currently failing to provide FAPE. You need to take a long, hard look at what this term truly is. You are in violation of FAPE and the civil rights of students with disabilities. I know this because there are complaints stacking up. I have been writing some of them with clients. And students are not receiving education as a result. This needs to be fixed. It needs to be fixed now. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Miss Mary Taylor. <laughs> Five pair of glasses just to see and read. Good evening, Board of Education members. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this evening. I'm here as a representative of the Baltimore County Parent and Student Coalition. We're almost 5,000 parent and student strong and we're growing every day. I bring to you some of their most recent concerns. School violence and safety. We will be in attendance for the event tomorrow night and have sent in our questions. This is an immediate problem and for the safety of staff and students, we would like to hear the action plan to address this immediately before it escalates to what we saw happen at Annapolis High School where two people were injured and seven people were arrested. School violence at BCPS is at an all time high. Once again, this needs to be addressed immediately. Academics, we've taken the time to look at the highlight page for each of the 175 schools within BCPS. Many schools are reporting extremely low numbers of students who are meeting, who are meeting the 61% proficiency rate in English and math. What actions is the curriculum department taking to provide teachers with material and trainings that will effectively teach the majority of students and raise proficiency rates across all schools? Here is the data for two schools recently highlighted by the superintendent and the board. For the year 2018 to 19, Deer Park Magnet Middle School had a 25% proficiency rate in English and a 12% proficiency rate in math. For Scott's Brands Elementary School in 2018 to 19, they had a 13% proficiency rate in English and a 17% proficiency rate in math. So at these two highlighted schools, 75% or more of the kids are not at the 61% proficiency rate in English and the 83% or, or more are not in the 61% proficiency rate in math. That was data from before the pandemic. I can only imagine how the prolonged closure of schools affected our students' education. What is the action plan to address the very low proficiency rates? We'd like to address bus issues. Students are not being picked up on time. Um, they are 
we like to have this issue addressed. We like to know what is going on to get all of our school kids on, to school on time, consistency and reliability. And Dr. Hager, if our group could have your attention one evening, we certainly would like to talk to you about the nutritional lunches that they're serving our kids on a daily basis at school. And we've had many complaints from parents about that. Uh, I understand we are having a food shortage at this moment, but we certainly can improve the nutritional status of the food that they're feeding our kids. So once again, I'd like to thank you all for the opportunity to speak this evening, and we hope that we can have our questions addressed soon. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Allison Stewart. Good evening, my name is Allison Stewart. I speak tonight on behalf of my fiance, Brian Pro, as well. Collectively, we have six children who attend BCPS, one of which has an IEP and receives, receives extensive special education supports. It seems now that we risk the possibility of FBI investigation for even questioning your supposed authority over our children. We are ready to accept that consequence. BCPS leadership Leadership is failing our students and staff on many fronts. Firstly, safety. Children should not be forced to wear masks as it does more harm than good, as cited in JAMA Pediatric Study dated June 30th, 2021. Masks also impair facial recognition that can have detrimental effect on socialization and communication. There is no scientific evidence to support your continuance of these so-called safety measures. Also troubling is the rise in violence equal to approximately 50% that has occurred this year in BCPS to include physical altercations, sexual harassment, and bullying. Secondly, content. Sh children should not be taught to judge themselves or their peers based on the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. We demand a transparent curriculum that supports this. Thirdly, money. Our school buildings should not be in disrepair as you hire what seems to be exponentially more administra administration. We need teachers, support staff, bus drivers, and well-trained additional adult assistants, not redundant bureaucratic positions that waste funding. Our teachers should not be struggling with limited resources when nearly half of our county annual budget is allocated for education. The overburdening teacher union and dysfunction of this board has cast us into the stone age of education while promising to prepare our children for the modern world. As parents, we will not be silenced. We will not be in fear of consequences for advocating for our children. We have been patient and understanding long enough. We are tired of the same excuses and response of, we are working on it. Every day when my children leave our home for school, I tell them, make good choices. I instill respect for their teachers and peers. I encourage an effective communication. I expect their best every day. Dr. Williams, it is time you start living up to those standards as well. Instead of photo ops and accepting awards, do your job. Solve these problems and show the work just as we accept our, expect our students to in school. You have an abundance of local delegates and officials willing to provide insight, but you seem to ignore their request as well. As constituents, we demand. Thank you. Next is Darren Padillo. Good evening. Uh, my name is Darren Badillo. I'm a concerned father of two students who attend BCPS, a deacon at my local church, a director of youth, um, a director of our youth mentorship program, and I'm running to be the next Baltimore County Executive, and I work with a lot of children each week. They have many concerns and don't feel safe in the Baltimore County schools. This past week, we had 200 students walk out of Patapsco High School 
on Friday because they felt their voices were not being heard and they wanted to get your attention and the public's attention and they did. Yesterday we had a peaceful protest so that they can get their voices heard as well as the parents. And I'd like to share with you a couple of things that they said to me. Some of the students mentioned that there's some sexual assaults being happening in the school and they feel like they're not even being addressed. There's incidents of harassment, intimidation that are not being addressed. I had a parent come up to me yesterday and say, Darren, I drop my students off, my three girls at their bus stop every morning. Did the school not plan and look at that their bus stops right in front of a registered sex offender? Do you guys think about that when you plan the bus stops? And I just have a few questions uh, for you guys. What are you gonna do about the sexual assaults, intimidation, and address the concerns of the 200 students that walked out of Patapsco High School? How, I, I wanna ask you guys a question as a board. You know, how do you rate your success? How do you rate if you're doing a good job or not? Because if it's by graduation rates, reading levels, math scores, you guys are failing. And I think it's time that you all need to humble yourself and say we failed our students. We need help, we don't know what to do. And I know it might seem like you're doing a good job when your boss gets an award for doing a good job, but I believe Dr. Williams, you need to give that award back. You didn't deserve it. We need to do better, we need to come together, and if you guys can't do it, just come out and say, hey, I can't do it, I need some help. We have a lot of parents, we have the Baltimore Parent Student and Coalition that are here for the parents. Uh, we have youth mentorship programs. Yesterday we had to give literature to parents to tell them what to do if you're being sexual assaulted or harassed. Why are you guys not pushing these forms to the parents and telling them if you have an issue, fill it out, get it to the principal. I think it's time for you guys to step up it's time for change. You're not doing a good job. Dr. Williams, give that award back. You don't deserve it. Next is Rob Stenkowski. Thank you very much for having me this evening. I appreciate it. My job is I'm the father of a couple girls that go to Baltimore County Schools. I am concerned with some of the proposals that you have in terms of getting a vaccination shot in order to play sports or being tested on a weekly basis. If you look at the CDC and the VAERS report for COVID that was put out September 24th of 2001, there were over 752,000 adverse events. There were over 15,000 deaths that had occurred. I personally think those numbers are low because I happen to know about 10 people that had adverse events from the shot and never went and contacted VAERS. I knew three people that actually got the first shot and had trouble with the second. Most of the people I know that have gotten the shot have gotten it because they felt pressured and bullied to get the shot. They didn't get the shot because they felt like it was a good shot to get because it's new. I am not against vaccines at all. I believe in vaccines and I think they're very good for people in the long term. But this is a very new vaccine that's had many adverse effects. The potential harm that exists from it is little known, especially in the mid to long term. What we do know is that children most likely have asymptomatic symptoms and they're usually very mild and they have no issue from this at all. The presumed benefit of the shots are minimal. That's why the boosters are always needed. Even the Israeli Prime Minister said that the world is our laboratory. I don't want to be a guinea pig. I don't want my kids to be guinea pigs on this shot that we need to have. Natural immunity from the infection is far more effective than the vaccine. Vaccinating children is not necessary to reach herd immunity. After a year and a half almost of people having pre-existing immunity from other coronaviruses and recovered from COVID-19 or having been vaccinated. Drug companies and you here in Baltimore County have zero liability if something happens to my child. If something happens to my child from the shot, my child becomes a statistic to you because you have no liability. According to John Hawkins study, the so-called Guller standard, there are 20 to 66% of the people who get the RT-PCR test that are 
false negatives. The CDC even warns not to give the test to asymptomatic people. Sweden and Denmark have halted the Moderna vaccine along with Finland and Iceland because of heart inflammation. The question I have for you, and I wish I could take credit for this, is why do the protected need to be protected from the unprotected by forcing the unprotected to use protection that the protected used in the first place? Do you know from 19, well, 2001 to 2010, one third of all drugs approved by the FDA had major safety issues. Vaccines can be good. This vaccine is way too new to be putting it on our kids. The mental issues that they're going to go through and the strain that they're going to go through from. Thank you. Next is Mr. Bash Vermont. Thank you for the opportunity. The chair of the calendar committee, who is a fine professional, appeased the multiple bargaining units in the design of the proposed calendar 22-23. The chair clearly preferred the pre-labor calendar. And at the calendar committee, which was this year, he explained that he preferred the pre because of some parents asked for it to help their children get a head start on athletics. And he stated that before you in past meetings. Let me tell you, this argument is an empty chair argument. And therefore, it is irrational. I have been in Baltimore since 1974. Everybody said the end of summer vacation is Labor Day. Both calendar proposals treat one minority religion as the most favorite as compared to the Muslim residents in this county. This principle is really a violation to whom we are. The two professional development days when only teachers are on duty are back to back within one month of the year. This really begs the question, if the two professional days slash holidays within one month, just to appease one minority religion, the question would be, are they beneficial to the education of our students. Ask yourself, do students truly benefit from professional two days within 30 days, and both are in the beginning of the year? This is why I advocated in the past for you to recommend starting post Labor Day all the time. This way there is no discussion, there is no issues. It's standardization, everybody knows. I will finish my presentation about the calendar in the next presentation during the public comments. Thank you for your listening. Thank you. Next is Kelly Krupinski. Good evening, um, Superintendent Williams and board members, uh, community members, thanks for allowing me the time to, to come and address the board. I really appreciate it. So without going into too much detail about my own children's experience with BCPS, I, I, I would have to um, unfortunately just sum it up as, as not good. Um, in particular, I have a son who is severely dyslexic, and over the last several years, we have met so many other kids like my son and have learned that for each child, there is a way that they can be reached 
and taught so that they can realize their full potential. Um, and, you know, that's ultimately why we're all here. I mean, right? You know, we're all here to make sure that our kids get what they need. And they need to know the basics, the fundamentals, uh, so that they can grow up and be independent and be successful. Um, you know, BCPS spends, you know, millions of dollars per academic year to place children with, with special learning needs outside of the public school system. And it gives me great pause to think of all the kids who are not included in this figure and who are not getting the benefit of the learning environments and teaching methods that they deserve to thrive. As, as parents, my husband and I wonder how many more millions of dollars are being spent on programs that are not designed to teach our kids the skills they need to be successful in the world. Our experience has shown us this is very often the case. So what is a parent such as myself to make of it when I hear the newest BCPS program to be piloted this year in middle schools called Stamped is to be focused on issues of race and justice? So I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to fathom truly how an institution created to teach our kids how to read, write, learn math and science, and clearly failing on all four of those scores, uh, could possibly dedicate one dollar to any other issue other than those, right? Um, these, re issue, these, these resources are valuable and we need them. So to do that outside of the role in which you all were intended, it just boggles me. I don't understand. From where I sit, it appears to me that BCPS has given up and thrown in the towel. And I remind you that that's not an option and as a parent. I'm here to tell you. Thank you. Next is Mr. Jamil. Mr. Jamil. Peace and blessings, Madam Chair Scott, Dr. Williams, members of the board, and everyone present here today. Our Constitution by itself was not sufficient to define equal freedom for all. So 10 amendments were made to the Constitution in 1791, which is called the Bill of Rights. Our Pledge of Allegiance was first composed by a Union Army officer. By the way, he became a teacher afterwards in the New York City school system. He, most schools, sorry, most scholars believe that it was Francis Bellamy who recomposed it in 1892, which was adopted in 1942. The words under God were added 47 years ago in 1954. The pledge as recited today declares indivisibility of our nation with liberty and justice for all. Yet the guarantee of such a pledge came only in 1964 when the Civil Rights Act made any discrimination illegal. The Voting Rights Act was passed a year later to enforce the 15th Amendment, which outlawed discriminatory voting practices. And it was only 18 years ago that Roe versus Wade protected pregnant women's liberty to choose to have abortion. Respected board members, you are witnessing the attempts and the trends in removing the words under God, restricting or reversing civil rights, voting rights, abortion rights. Such reversals of our democratic values that we hold is a threat to our democracy. 
This ex-PTA president of 1984 struggled with the assistance of colleagues for 33 years, a lifetime, to educate the BCPS boards about the divisiveness, inequality, injustice, discrimination, and exclusion of the needs of Muslim students. Only one of their holidays was recognized as equal to two for the other minority three years ago. It is disappointing and demoralizing that we are witnessing the board following the trend of reversals by rescinding that decision and deny inclusion, equal treatment, and justice to Muslim students. We have been witnessing that there is only one preference for one minority for whom the two days closings have been on autopilot for inclusion every year. The pursuit of liberty and justice must be equal for everyone. We request that the decision made three years ago be upheld and reinstate the closing of the schools on Eid al-Fitr. Thank you for listening. God bless you all. Thank you. Next is Beverly Folkolf. Good evening. My name is Beverly Folkolf, and I'm reading the remarks of Marcy Cook, who is a teacher and the vice president of TABCO. We are here tonight speaking as individuals. Before sharing the Caliphate preference that I believe is best for our students, I want to implore you to reconsider the status of the Jewish holidays. Back in 1995, Jewish holidays became non-school days because they caused an adverse impact on our school system's operations. There was a large absence of educators and in some areas, students. It was deemed unsafe to run schools and too costly to pay for so many substitute teachers. In 2015, Governor Hogan mandated that schools open after Labor Day. BCPS had the shortest school day, and it changed the Jewish holidays from days off to professional development days. These days were not supposed to include any required sessions that those of us observing the holidays would have to make up. This was not the case this year. I personally missed a three-hour live PD session for the new geometry curriculum. Special educators were given this time to complete the compensatory service review of their caseloads. This is 13 and a half hours of time that they had to make up on their own. I know that BCPS offered compensation to make up this time, but then you're asking them to complete it outside of their duty day and take away time from their families. In the 2015 Policy Review Committee, it was stated that you were going to look for quantifiable data to be shared in three to five years. I was assuming this would be staff attendance rates. Do you have the absent rates of educators for the Jewish Holy Days? How many educators are missing out on PDs or time to work in their classrooms? I know federal and state law does not support any acknowledgement of religion as a basis for closing schools, but our two biggest breaks are centered around the Christian holidays of Christmas and Easter. I am not one to complain without offering a suggestion to fix the problem. It may not be well received, but why not shorten spring break by two days, making those two days professional days so that it would be equitable to compensate for the Jewish holidays. We have had years in the past where spring day break was just a four day weekend. We could do so again. As for my calendar preference, I prefer the pre-Labor Day start. Students getting amped up, get amped up for school around Memorial Day. And by the end of August, the summer has run its course and kids could be benefit from being back into the routine and structure of school. As an educator, I appreciate having students back for a few days to start getting used to the policies and procedures of the classroom and then having a long weekend before getting into the swing of academics. It seems to me it'd be more beneficial for our students to end school on June 14th rather than 21st. In conclusion, I'm asking and advocating for a pre-Labor Day start for schools, a shortening of the spring break, and the full return of the Jewish holidays to days off. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next is public comment on the proposed 2022-2023 school calendar. And our first speaker is Jeffrey Friedman. Good evening, board members. 
And my name is Jeff Friedman, and I'm a veteran BCPS teacher. I'm here tonight kindly asking you to adopt a post-Labor Day calendar for the 22 to 23 school year and for every year moving forward. During the last board meeting, I was disappointed that any time a board member asked a question or made an inquiry relating to a post-Labor Day start, it was quickly dismissed. The calendar committee argued that starting earlier was necessary because student athletes report to school sooner. Since this is around August 15th, are they pushing to begin school then or do they want more academic pressure on athletes earlier? Our calendar is not constructed around the sports schedule. Next, they stated that there would be a need for childcare during the last week before Labor Day. Is the purpose of education to provide childcare or is it learning? No matter what, there's always a need for extra childcare both before the school year starts and after it ends because camps never start and end the exact day before or after the school year. In addition, it was stated that this extra week would be academically beneficial, yet no one could provide any data saying how starting in August actually benefited students. In fact, the Maryland Task Force found no negative impact starting post Labor Day, and yet these studies were also ignored. They also stated that seven students were connected with 4-H activities at the state fair. I go every year and visit the 4-H building, and after viewing many student projects likely from Baltimore County, this number must be in the hundreds or more. This is an important form of learning that they would either have to lose or miss school if we started earlier. Then was the concern about ending too late in June. I shared with you a calendar with 180 student days beginning September 6th and then ending June 12th. It includes all required Comoro holidays, BCPS priorities, and staff professional development. Is June 12th too late to end school? I also reached out to many current and former colleagues via email and text to see how they felt. Knowing that morale is a concern within BCPS currently, I asked if it would help if we started post Labor Day and ended at a reasonable time in June every year. They were overwhelmingly in agreement. One said, I 100% believe a post Labor Day start would help in part to increase morale of staff. With everything going on, this is a necessity for staff and students. Another read, 100%. And yet another, I do prefer an after Labor Day start. There were also some other comments. Now that we have the extra 15 minutes, why are there more than 180 student days in the proposed calendars, unlike other counties? This is to increase to the 191 teacher day maximum. Instead, we can show appreciation by eliminating this practice. Please also keep the religious holidays, professional development days to avoid lengthening the year. And lastly, in previous pre-Labor Day calendars, there were up to 185 student days and close to 200 teacher days. This required teachers to report to work around August 15th and still end mid-June, which significantly cut summer. I'm asking you to respect the much needed summer as is happening in most surrounding counties who start after Labor Day annually. Please help improve morale by voting for a post-Labor Day start, a 180-day maximum student year, and teacher PD days as they are now. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Bash Ferron. So as I said, the proposed calendar treats the Jewish holidays as a favorite one and ignores all others. Eid al-Fatr carries the same meaning as Yom Kippur. The dates of Eid al-Fatr are Tuesday, May 3rd, 2022, and Friday, April 21st, 2023. Eid al-Adha is the feast of sacrifice as dictated by Prophet Abraham. Muslim students and parents travel before and after Eid al-Adha, which falls on Sunday 7-10-2022 and on Thursday 6-29-2023. The two Jewish and the Islamic holidays have the same meaning the same culture, family, festivity. Both minorities calculate their holidays in a lunar year. Both are important for the social interaction and education of our students. Rosh Hashanah is the Jewish New Year. It has the same culture as the Hijri New Year and also the Chinese or the Asian New Year, the Hindu year and other holidays. 
This begs the question why BCPS celebrates one faith New Year and does not really celebrate the Muslim, the Asian, the Hindu, or any other holidays. I always asked you for equality, always. Two equals two, one equals one, zero equals zero. And the people of Baltimore County basically ask you to honor that principle because really for almost 20 years I always hear and I support the principle of equity and equality. I left Syria 48 years ago. I had a house, a desk, lots of books. I could have been a millionaire. I came here for the freedom for whom we are. And I do not want to see my grandchildren being treated inferiorly. I ask you to treat the Muslim holidays equal to the Jewish holidays. Zero equals zero, two equals two. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Mr. Jamil. Madam Chair Scott, I reiterate my blessings to all of you and everyone present. We are sensitive to the issue of inequality of treatment regarding closings of the schools on the religious holidays of the students of all faiths. Minority students who are Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, Chinese, other than those of Jewish faith, have to attend the classes on their high holidays unless they accept penalty of imperfect attendance status and also having to double up on their homework, make up quizzes, tests, exams, and missing the athletics too. Having been an observer in the past calendar committees, we are no less sensitive to the dilemma and the challenges faced by the superintendent's calendar committee members in trying to juggle the variables to come up with the calendar. Two past serving members of the board, Mr. Michael Kennedy and Mr. Nicholas Kemp, had proposed a solution which we agreed to accept. They had suggested to eliminate all non-Komar holidays, closings, and instead approve two floating holidays that the students of their faith could take off on their high holidays, just as teachers can take off two personal days off without having to shut down all the 178 schools affecting nearly 112,000 students and nearly 8,500 staff members. Under such proposed policy, no homework, quizzes, tests, or exams would be conducted on those days, which could be four, six, or eight days in the entire year. Services of substitute teachers could also be utilized as necessary. Of course, the calendar committee and the school principals would be given the dates of those holidays. Such policy would also meet the test of liberty and justice for all, as it is pledged every day that I mentioned in my last presentation. Unfortunately, such a proposal was shut down to maintain the status quo of one preferred minority by closing all schools for all the 112,000 students. We are not in your shoes. You have chosen to volunteer your services, expertise, and sacrifice your time to make sure that all students are treated as indivisible with liberty and justice while providing quality education and equal treatment. Request that until such time that you choose this policy, the two rescinded or one rescinded holiday closing for Muslims be reinstated. That will be a justice. Thank you, and God bless you all. 
Thank you. And that concludes public comment. The next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report for that. Call on Dr. Williams. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Scott and members of the board. Tonight I present an update on information shared at the last board meeting. Specifically, I will provide celebrations, operational updates, and next steps related to the Public Works Operational Efficiency Review. My team and I will regularly update the board, our community, and Team BCPS during this time of change. Our partnership is critical to ensuring high quality services to the students, staff, and families of Baltimore County. I think we have some slides. So as part of our continued efforts to recover, rebuild, and heal, we must acknowledge our current state have frank dialogue about our path forward and collaboratively create the climate and conditions necessary for collective healing. My team and I continue to meet with principals, visit schools, speak with staff, and engage with union presidents and executive directors through weekly check-ins and monthly sessions. We also look forward to future opportunities to engage with the community. Our goal is to demonstrate our commitment to supporting schools in a responsive, collaborative and differentiated manner. Updates included in this evening's report will include evidence of these commitments. Next slide. Yes, Team BCPS joins the entire staff and state in congratulating Brianna Ross on being named Maryland's Teacher of the Year. She represents not only the best of Baltimore County's teachers, but the best of Maryland's educators. And we are so proud of her. She epitomizes what it means to be a talented teacher, a dedicated professional, a lifelong learner, and a caring, compassionate counselor and friend to students everywhere. Ms. Ross, now in her sixth year of teaching, serves as Deer Park Social Studies Department Chair equity liaison and summer transition program coordinator. She has forged a reputation as a thoughtful and probing educator, working to make lessons relevant to the lives of her students and asking them in return for a high level of analysis, creativity, and out of the box thinking. She has been a strong advocate for her students, particularly students of color and for their success. Ms. Ross will compete for the National Teacher of the Year honors. She says, in my classroom, I have created a culture that prioritizes building positive relationships and academic rigor above all else. This is what she wrote in her BCPS Teacher of the Year application essay. She also said, it is my mission to ensure that when each of my students step into my space, they feel that they are part of a community that loves them, values who they are, and will protect them no matter what. Taking care of my students will always be my first priority. Congratulations to Ms. Brianna Ross and the Deer Park Magnet Middle School community. Can we acknowledge them one more time, please? <laughs> Congratulations, Ms. Ross. Next slide, please. Thank you. October is National Principals Month. It is my honor to bring attention to our schoolhouse leaders and their dedication to our students, schools, and communities. Board Chair Makita Scott and I recorded a video to recognize and thank these talented and hardworking administrators for the work they do to lead instructional programs, manage staff, build parent and community relationships, manage facilities, and more. As a former high school and middle school principal, I can attest to the challenges and rewards of being a principal. However, I have never been a principal during a pandemic. I would like to take this moment to acknowledge the unique challenges our principals are facing as they implement new and shifting policies in response to a global pandemic. We are working every day to find ways to lighten the load, show appreciation, and provide support to our leaders because our students, staff, and school communities need them and respect them. If you have not done already, please take some time to thank your principal. 
So board, let's thank our 176 principals that we have in Baltimore County. Thank you. Next slide. Courtney Brown, the supervisor of mental health services for Baltimore County Public Schools, has been honored by the National Alliance for Mental Illness Metropolitan Baltimore as the recipient of the Francis J. Lentz Mental Health Professional of the Year Award for 2021. We are pleased that they have honored Courtney Brown with this well-deserved award. She exemplifies our system-wide commitment to our students' mental health and social emotional well-being. Her expertise, dedication, and collaborative style greatly enhance the services we are able to offer. Congratulations to Courtney Brown. Let's clap. Thank you. So as we're moving forward with our published timelines and processes related to the operational efficiency review by the Public Works LLC, I am pleased to share that we have sent divisional work group invitations and posted stakeholder members membership applications. We will be conducting facilitator training this week and during the week of October 18th as previously reported. Work group meetings will begin the week of October 25th. They will occur bi-weekly and be scheduled from 60 to 90 minutes in duration. All meetings will include published agendas and action notes. I'll share my next update on October 26. On Friday, October 8th, I received a joint response to the Public Works LLC Operational Efficiency Review from our union president and executive director. Our unions, which represent nearly 14,000 Baltimore County Public Schools employees, identified five efficiency review recommendations that have prioritized as urgent and requiring immediate attention. The recommendations are closely aligned with the priorities that I outlined at the September 28th Board of Education meeting. We agree that the following items require a collaboration and immediate attention. One, address Office of Payroll, Office of Certification, and Office of Benefits errors. Mitigate the substitute crisis while seeking a permanent solution. Streamline and improve the onboarding process. Increase staffing and full review and correction of all salary scales. Since the Board of Education meeting, I have taken several action steps to resolve concerns, including committing to a full review of all salary schedules. Today, I had the opportunity to speak with all union presidents and executive director during our monthly scheduled UPED meeting, what we call UPED meeting, union presidents, executive director meeting, to discuss these priorities and provide an update on our ongoing efforts. As we move forward, it is important that everyone has a voice in the process. We will continue to take a studied and balanced approach in this examination of this efficiency report and make sure that we are aligned with all recommendations with the blueprint for Maryland's future and our compass and review these plans with the stakeholder work group. I appreciate the advocacy and continued partnership of our union leadership. We're all part of Team BCPS, and I look forward to working together to ensure success of our system. Next slide, please. As we stated before, some of our work is tied directly to budget cycles and hinges on position management. However, we are actively working to resolve operation concerns right now. We have committed to a salary study, as I shared before, for all unions. Our manager of staff relations will be leading this work in collaboration with union presidents and staff. We continue to host job fairs to attract high quality applicants. Most recently, we have reached out to retirees and invited them to rejoin our workforce. We have engaged in conversations with human resource systems experts and hope to bring forward a comprehensive approach for board consideration at an upcoming meeting. The Office of Transportation has worked diligently to ensure that all schools receive timely communication about bus operations. To address the bus shortage, we have partnered with our county executive's office to explore incentives to better attract and retain staff. We hope to announce the results of that partnership soon. We look forward to our virtual town hall focused on safe and supportive environments tomorrow. This is the first of many conversations on this important topic. 
We have collected many questions from our community and will address them during the dialogue. We are continuing to provide overtime compensation to all staff involved in contact tracing efforts. We're also hiring additional contracted nurses and or contact tracers to support schools. And last slide. We will continue to update the board, our community and team BCPS during these times. Our partnership is very important and I thank you for this time and this concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Okay, so the next item on the agenda is the board chair's report. And um, as I've been doing, I do have a video. So once that's ready, we can put that up. Um, but I would like to also echo some of what Dr. Williams said with Happy National uh, Principals Month. Also, um, it's Hispanic Heritage Month from the 12th until October 15th. So I wanted to um, say, um, acknowledge um, Hispanic Heritage Month. I also wanted to make sure that we can, I congratulated Dr. Williams on his award from the NAACP of Baltimore County um, for excellence in education. So congratulations, let's give him a hand. <laughs> Dr. Williams acknowledges everybody else, so I wanted to <laughs> make sure um, we acknowledged him as well. So, yeah. So is it ready? It's ready. Oh, okay, great. There we go. Hello, BCPS. I am Makita Scott, the chair of the Board of Education of Baltimore County, and I'm excited. The new school year is underway, and it is a bold, hopeful time. Most of all, for our amazing and always thoughtful students. Their voices are always the most important to hear. So let's listen to what a few of them had to say about the joy of being back in school. After over a year of virtual learning, I expected to be nervous and thrown off my game when I came back to school. However, on the first day when I walked into the building, it felt like I was picking up where I'd left off. It's been so great seeing my teachers and having the opportunity to hang out with friends after not seeing them for so long. I've been extremely happy to see the teachers and see my friends that I love so much. And I'm so excited that classes are in person because it's just so much fun when it's in person. It's These perceptive pupils also had some wise words for the leadership of BCPS, including our Board of Education. Here's what they had to say about what we can do to improve the lives and learning experiences of our students. I think school leaders and the members of the board should emphasize the importance of social distancing and wearing masks and also taking the vaccine so that everyone can be safe. Quarantine and online learning has taught everyone that students face distractions at home and it would be nice for school leaders and members of the board to provide schools with enough resources so that students can focus on school even when they're at home, whether they're facing distractions or not. Thank you to Christina Giovanni of Lock Raven High School and Talu Talabi of George Washington Carver Center for the Arts and Technology for sharing their views with us. I also want to congratulate the students, staff, and community supporters at 17 of our schools who won the Environmental Literacy Grants for their participation in the Clean Green 15 anti-littering program. Finally, I would like to take a moment to remember a board member who suddenly left us two years ago this month. Roger Hayden's unexpected passing occurred while he was still a member of the board, but his accomplishments continue to inspire us and serve BCPS today. We remember Mr. Hayden this month with fondness and gratitude. Thank you for joining us for this edition of From the Chairwoman's Corner. Hope to see you soon. Those kids were wonderful. <laughs> I, I just, um, I was so proud of them. I, I, I asked them, what are some of the things that, some advice you would give us? You have at, the envelope of who will be the 2022 yeah. Maryland Teacher of the Year. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm not sure what that was, but um, again, um, those that was that was wonderful. So um, I would also um, like to congratulate um, the 
Teacher of the Year, Miss um, Brianna Ross. Uh, that's also a wonderful accomplishment, and um, we couldn't be prouder of her. So um, thank you all so much. So next is on the agenda is the student's report, Mr. Christian Thomas. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair, Superintendent Williams, board members, the public, and students of BCPS. I want to start off by, again, congratulating Dr. Williams on his Excellence in Education NAACP Award for Baltimore County. So can we give him another round of applause? Uh, although sometimes the board might not agree with Dr. Williams, and although sometimes uh, the public might not agree with Dr. Williams, um, he always has the focus on students at his heart, and he's doing everything he can to make our school system better. So thank you, Dr. Williams, again. I also want to congratulate Ms. Brianna Ross, our Maryland State Teacher, our Maryland, for the Maryland State Teacher of the Year uh, Award. I think that was incredible, and I'm so happy to see Baltimore County represented up there. All right, now for my report. Yesterday was one of the most incredible days I've had as the student member of the board so far. I got to get outside of the walls of this boardroom and outside of the walls of my high school and visit one of our amazing schools, Patapsco High School and Center for the Arts. From the second I walked into the building, I could feel the energy and creativity teeming from the walls. As many of us know, Patapsco was recently in the news for a student-led demonstration about their advisory period. And I want to take a minute to commend the students that safely organized this and for Principal Rodriguez Hobbs and all the faculty that helped ensure that this demonstration was appropriate while still encouraging students to speak up. I loved talking to Dr. Rodriguez Hobbs about his plans after the demonstration and learning about the ways he intends to listen to what his students had to what his students were advocating for, and bringing all of it into consideration for future decisions. It's our leaders like that who encourage student voice, and although, who encourage student voice that can make our schools excellent places. Like I said before, while visiting Topsco, I was blown away. I got to speak with so many of our students, in Fatapsco's uh, vocal music program, and we had an incredible conversation about how she very well might be the next Jenny from the block. I was able to witness some individuals in their dance program in an actual dance studio with the bars and everything, and got to learn from some students in their graphic design art class as they told me about their art curriculum and showed me some of their work. I also got to see Patapsco's renovated library with an entire section dedicated to LGBTQIA works and so much more. It was so inspiring to see. But a conversation with one student really sticks out to me. When I went into her art class as the period was just beginning, I walked around the room and asked some of the students to show me their work. First off, whoa, the freshmen in that class are so incredibly talented. They were flipping through their sketchbooks, showing me some of their sketches from before and during class. But that one student had a blank page. After speaking with a nearby student, I went over to her and asked to see some of her work. And she said, no, I'm not really that good at art. And I was like, what? You're here in an art magnet program. I want to see what you have to do. And she was like, yeah, I'm in the program, but not because of art. And I asked, then why is she in the program if she's not interested in art? And she said, you see, I'm a transgender student. And if I went to my home school, I would have to spend every day getting bullied and harassed. That's one of our ninth grade students here in BCPS. She said if she went to her home school, she would face the brunt of bullying and harassment. And I could relate to that. You know, those are some of my same worries when I was going into high school. One of the reasons that I chose Eastern Tech. And even now, as I'm thinking about where I should go for college, the question is always, will I be included? Will I be included for who I am, for my identity? And that this is today. This is now. Today, we have kids like in our school system applying to magnet programs to flee their home schools just for acceptance. We have students who are so afraid of being in an environment that they have perceived to be filled with fights or with violence that they're applying for magnet programs, not for the academic excellence of a CTE program or to enjoy that program, but instead just not to go to their home school. And that shouldn't be our ca the case. Our students should be applying to magnet programs because they want to actually participate in that program. We should be able to choose between a safe and inclusive school right in our community or a safe and inclusive school at a magnet program. All of our schools should be safe and inclusive. And although I have seen some strides to go towards that, I think we can be doing more as a system. I think we can be doing more as a board of education to address that. I look at our agenda tonight, and the things we're talking about today aren't directly related to students. We could be focusing more on students, and not just the academic test scores, not just the data that we have for students, but for our students as a whole, for our students' mental health, 
for how our students feel in the school building. And that won't be easy, but like I said before, I have seen strides in this, in this direction, and I can't wait to see those strides continue as we go forward. So thank you again, Patafsco, for inviting me to your school. It was excellent. I can't wait to visit again soon, and go check out that library section because you know, I'm looking for some new reads. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. So the next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that, I call on Mr. Bursides. Okay, thank you. The next item on the agenda is contract awards, and for that, I call on Mr. McMillian, Vice Chair of the Building and Contracts Committee. Good evening. Members of the board, the board's Building and Contracts Committee met Monday, October 11, 2021. Items K through 1, items K-1 through K-9 are being forwarded to the full board for approval. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve items K-1 through K-9? So moved, Offerman. Thank you. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? Yes, Mr. Offerman. Yes, I just have a concern, not a concern, but, but I have a question about the audium, the auditorium restoration project, Delaney High. And then I was wondering uh, if if BCPS has or is involved with any kind of fire insurance, because I believe the damage there was, uh, was, uh, was in fact uh, due to fire. Can anyone address that, please? Yes. Yes, oh. Mr. Sayers, thank you, Mr. Sayers. Thank you. Yes, uh, Mr. Offerman and, and members of the board, the, uh, the Board of Education is a member of the Maryland Association of Boards of Education uh, group insurance pool. And so uh, this is a covered event with a $5,000 deductible. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Ms. Causey. Thank you. Um, first, I want to say that um, in this National Principals Month, um, it's important to acknowledge the leadership of Delaney High School that very quickly responded and uh, limited the damage um, to, this, um, to this fire. So we want to commend the leadership of that school. Um, also, we heard um, earlier from uh, the case executive director about the length of contracts. Um, and it also, they were addressing um, issues of supports for schoolhouse. Um, so I just wondered, it's listed in here, the date of the fire is September 13th. Um, and uh, so we're uh, um, fulfilling this contract a month later. So I'm just curious what work has been done. Has it been done by um, internal uh, support staff? Because I know that there has work that has been done, so thankfully. Yeah, so uh, under, under our procurement regulations, uh, we immediate, we brought a we identified a vendor as soon as possible, and and proceeded on an expedited basis to bring this to the board. But given the emergency circumstances, we began work. Uh, we we certainly haven't waited since September 13th to begin work, and uh, the indications so far, although the work the remediation is not complete. We think that it may well exceed $150,000, and if so, we would uh, come back to the board uh, when we have a, a firm estimate for that and, and amend this uh, exhibit to reflect that amount. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Ms. Mack and then Dr. Heger. Mr. Saris, um, in answer to Mr. Offerman's question, you said that we have an insurance policy, but that we have a $5,000 deductible. Did I hear Correct. you? Correct. So are, are we going to get reimbursed for these expenses? Yes. Oh, so this is just to pay it out and get the work done, and then we reimburse it, and it'll be reimbursed anything other than the $5,000 deductible? Correct. Okay, thank you. Sure. Dr. Hager? Um, I wanted to talk for a moment about the technology product line contract, um, just because it's so large. Um, and I just wanted to, to dig a little bit deeper into it. Um, 
So the modification is more than double or about double the amount of the original contract. And the description talks about continued purchase of various hardware and software, but it's eight and a half million dollar modification. So could you tell us a little bit more kind of in lay terms about why we need to approve an eight and a half million dollar modification and specifically the line that says non-public school purchases of technology equipment? Sure. Um, what non-public schools would be, would be getting right. $1.1 so $1 million? Part of the ESSER 1 CARES grant included a $2.6 million set aside for the 52 uh, eligible private schools who submitted a proposal. And under the, under the law, BCPS is required to uh, administer those funds, per procure them through our system, and then uh, make sure that they get to those non-public or private schools. So that's part of our obligation under ESSER 1. I didn't know that. Thank you. That was sure. interesting. Um, and could you tell us a little bit more about the other $7.4 sure. million? Uh, it, it's fairly well highlighted uh, in the bullets, I think, on page two. Uh, the largest portion of this additional uh, spending relates to another uh, federal grant through the E-rate program, which uh, for which we uh, will continue to provide hotspot capacity internet access for our students. Uh, we currently, uh, we purchased a lot of the hardware with our original $750,000 broadband grant back in 2020, and we've used some of the other ESSER funds to uh, continue paying those, that data, monthly data capacity. And so uh, this will allow us to continue to do so. We do have some operating funds and uh, some Title I funds that are also available, but the largest part of this is from that newly established E-rate grant. Um, the next uh, three items, the, um, the class flow software, the light speed content software, and Safari Media are both uh, longstanding applications that we've used here in the system. And so this would be for annual renewals uh, for those services. We talked about non-public. Uh, the last item, which are Promethean audiovisual equipment. Uh, that's something that's much, much uh, inequitably, shall we say, dispersed. All the new schools have the latest and greatest, and uh, the renovated schools, of course, the re uh, the replaced schools. Um, but uh, you know, there's 7,000 classrooms in the system. And they're all in, have various states of audiovisual technology. And so um, we are putting together a uh, competitive bid to uh, look at doing a system wide uh, upgrade to bring all the classrooms up to the current standard of new schools. Um, but we do have uh, about 600,000 embedded in our IT budget. And schools purchase this equipment on their own, out of their own budget. They get sometimes donations. And so this will allow uh, some, some purchasing capacity for schools and the Department of IT to use uh, what funds we might have. Sometimes at the end of the year, we will uh, ask that the board transfer funds to uh, do some much needed AV uh, upgrades. So that's pretty much the gamut. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. The, sure. And the Promethean boards, I think, are a, a wonderful thing. As you said, we know they're inequitably distributed now. The hotspots are a little concerning to me just because it seems like a temporary solution for a longstanding issue. Um, so the plan is temporary hotspots for children as opposed to working with the county to ensure Wi-Fi accessibility. Well, uh, Mr. Corns can tell you the projects that he's worked on with the county and of course the state has a longer term broadband initiative um, 
I, I will just interrupt and just say, Dr. Haver, that's some of the work that we're looking at shared services mm -hmm. that came out of our efficiency review. Okay. So I appreciate your point, and we'll be able to provide some additional updates on that. Yeah, and you're, you don't need to get into the details. So yeah. thank you. Yes, Ms. Mack? Mr. Saris, there's a line on here that says the academic content of this contract was discussed at the curriculum committee on September 16th, and I guess this really is a question for Mr. Corns. Is included in this contract the, um, I, I wish I could remember the term. Panels. Thank you. The panels, is, is, is that included in this contract? Yeah, so, um, so some of it is, Ms. Mack, that is underneath the Promethean portion of this. As Mr. Saris was pointing out, we went back and made sure and are making sure that we have uh, adequately aligned the procurement process with the amount of spending that we want to put into this. So we're working on a competitive contract that would be um, above and beyond this one-year contract here for PEPM. So the thing that we, the, the panels we talked about in curriculum committee, we are working diligently to get a better spending vehicle on that uh, to be put in place. Uh, this contract will be, per, will provide us some, some initial start in that stop gap as we're getting a better contract vehicle in place to do a larger scale move out. Um, and my staff is already working on that. So I thought part, and I think Dr. Hager was getting to some of this, I thought some of the conversation that we had was the inequitable distribution of anything, that okay. some schools, as Mr. Sarah says, have, have Promethean boards, some purchased them, some have never had them, um, some use whiteboards. So I thought that these panels were going to be a replacement for Promethean boards. So one, one manufacturer of, of flat panels is Promethean. Okay. Um, and so th this contract covers Promethean as a vendor, so their flat panels would be covered here. The, the, it's not an interactive whiteboard as though you're picturing with a projector. It's an actual flat panel with touch right. capability. Yes, ma'am. And do you have a number for the, included in this contract, how many of those flat panels are, are, is this paying for? So with, this, with the $2 million spending authority, um, that's probably about a thousand of them to start. And we haven't made a decision where they're going to go yet? No, ma'am. We're still working on that planning. As, as we work to get these, these contract vehicles in place, that is part of the planning around how we would distribute. So I presume that ClassFlow will work on the Prometheum flat panels. Yep. Will it also work on non-Prometheum flat panels? Yes, ma'am. It's a, it's a web-based piece of software. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Very much. Any additional comments or questions? Yes, Ms. Colsey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I had questions about this contract and, and another one, so if I could do both at once. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We can't hear you. Thank you. So I had questions about this contract and then another one, so I'll just do one at a time. Um, so with this contract, uh, contract MWE 811-20. Um, when we were at the Maryland Association Boards of Education conference last week, the state superintendent Chaudhry said that the MSDE has um, a Vedic technology and curriculum materials list. And so I'm wondering, are the, um, is the technology and the curriculum materials on here, uh, was MSDE's um, vetted list used as a resource? Ms. Cosey, I haven't seen that list from the state superintendent. Well, it, it's already, uh, before he arrived, it's been on, available through the Maryland State Department of Education. I'm sorry, was this discussed in committee, Mr. McMillian? I'm not, not that sure. I remember. Not no. that I remember. Was this discussed in committee? I don't know anything about this list, so okay. we didn't ask that question. We asked lots of other questions. Okay. <laughs> so this is... Interesting. Uh, I'm just curious. I, I'm sorry. Just I, I don't want to take your time, but um, the the panels you were discussing is that uh, along with other Promethean board and and hardware that that we currently use within the system. That's what this 
contracts talking about right it's the same the same vendor mr mr kuhn it's uh, a different technology uh most of our promethean boards now are flat white panels with projectors these are basically televisions with touch sensitive in the front same manufacturer um so, so miss causey we would have to go and do some research and come back and give you an update on your question um thank you and also um in response to Ms. Mack's questions, and um, you said that the, you're developing uh, an RFP. Mm -hmm. um, so does that mean that these products are potentially more expensive than what can be purchased later after the RFP comes out? No, ma'am. This is a very competitive contract for the quantity that we'd be looking at. Okay. Um, well, I'm concerned that um, the Maryland State Department of Education um, resources were not utilized um, and it, it's also uh, been a recommendation that the contracts be um, split where they're not as complicated and uh, unclear with several different vendors pro each providing different um, types of equipment so that's a concern of mine thank you that's time yes dr williams did you want to no, I, well, I, I was at the conference. I heard the comments. I'm not quite sure um, the question that was asked, but I will follow up with um, Dr. Scriven's point and Dr. McComas because there were some co comments about curriculum and resources and technology. So we will be happy to follow up on that. Uh, for those who were just not those who weren't there at the conference, the state superintendent really gave his vision about the work and, and how he is really changing MSDE and he will be visiting schools and school systems looking for best practices. And so um, I think I will have to go back to my notes, but I'm not quite sure um, if all the specificity that Ms. Causey shared, but I think there's, it's just a follow up we need to do uh, we, we do collaborate def definitely with the Maryland State Department of Education and other local school systems. We work with our specialists to look at what's uh, appropriate for students. So um, that's just a follow up. Thank you. Mr. Thomas? Thank you. Um, regarding these, this is a comment, uh, regarding these Promethean boards, uh, I just want to say that the flat panels that are, are in question right now are things that I use every single day in my Latin class. And uh, in the curriculum committee meeting, we discussed uh, how this would be a system-wide uh, type of initiative where we're going to have flat panels in all of our schools. And I think that was going to be an amazing asset. Because I remember being an elementary school student, getting those from Promethean boards with the projectors and the white screens uh, right in kindergarten my first day. And then I remember going to Summers or middle school, my, my middle school, and not having Promethean boards and not having that interactive component. But this is going to be very innovative for our schools. This is going to be something that is going to be extremely beneficial for all of our students. And so I'm excited to see these flat panels coming in and as a, as a part of this contract under the Promethean $2.25 million. Um, I think it's going to be a great asset and I hope that we approve this contract. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? No? Okay, Ms. Gover, may we take a roll call vote, please? Excuse me, Madam Chair, are we mm -hmm. voting on all of them or just one? This oh, one we're contract. All we're voting on all. We're voting on all of them. The the motion was moved out of the, the committee for items K one through K nine, so we're voting on all of them. Abstain. Yes. 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 Thank you. So the next item on the agenda is the update on the operational review for the Board of Education. So do we have the slide? Okay. So, um, taking a page <laughs> so I'm taking a page out of um, from staff <laughs> with yeah. some of your presentations and your, and your reviews so um, 
Yeah, so <laughs> we'll see how this works. So basically, um, we were also reviewed, and um, there was some feedback um, for us as a board. And so we also are wanting to be responsive, as um, Dr. Williams has led with what um, the staff are doing and how they're working on this. So this is what um, we, uh, the, the Vice Chair, um, Ms. Hen and I put together, but this is a living, breathing document, and um, I'll just go into it. So um, one of the findings was um, the BCPS board should adopt a civility policy, attend Maryland Association of Boards of Education, MABE, team building workshops, the board chair should complete a parliamentary procedure course, and the board legal counsel should be required to earn a professional registered parliamentarian credential. So on August 24, 2021, the board unanimously adopted um, our board principles, which Mr. Thomas is holding up, and we, I thought, I, I believe we each have one at our, um, at our desk. Thank you. <laughs> Scalzi's holding us up too. So yes, we all have that. So that um, was one of the um, one of the things that we were to work on, and then based on. Um, Board principals develop a board civility policy at an upcoming PRC meeting, and we met at PRC, and that's one of the things also that, that we are going to develop. And the board chair, myself, I've participated in two uh, MABE-sponsored parliamentary procedure workshops, and I'm always exploring additional training resources. <laughs> so that's one part. Um, another finding they had was the BCPS school board should make updating its operation operating manual a high priority. On September 28, 2021, the board adopted the revised board handbook, um, which was done by the committee, and it was a very good handbook, and I think it's something that we all contributed to and, and um, can be proud of. Third, the BCPS board should enlist MABE to conduct work sessions on board governance with a goal of minimizing or eliminating micromanagement of staff and to establish a topical yearly work session calendar. So um, based on this, seven board members attended the annual MABE conference from October 6th to the 21st, where, um, as you've heard, several members... I'm sorry, <laughs> October 6th to the 8th of 2021. And um, you've heard several of us speak, thank you all for that, by the way, um, heard several of us speak about that, uh, the conference, what we learned, and how we're bringing that back here, and I'm um, working um, together on that. And then also a yearly work session calendar was shared with board members at our retreat in August of 2021 with an opportunity for feedback. And the board, the board will review potential resources through MABE because they have upcoming um, trainings and sessions. So our next steps is that we're going to review additional recommendations and report them as they become available because we wanted um, uh, the uh, staff, everyone to know that we heard what was said, we see what we need to work on, and we are taking steps to work in that direction. So um, we also are holding each other accountable, and um, the next report will be November 9th of 2021. So thank you all for your time. <laughs> okay. Okay, so the next item on the agenda are information items, which include the Central Area Education Advisory Council meeting minutes of September 22nd, 2021, and the Southwest Area Education Advisory Council meeting minutes of September 20th, 2021. And the next item on the agenda is board member comments and consideration of agenda items for future board meetings. Board members, please note that items provided at past meetings have been received and are being reviewed. So um, we can go ahead and start. Um, it looks like we will start with Ms. Causey. Good evening. I just wanted to dovetail uh, with what has already been said tonight and to just sincerely congratulate Ms. Brianna Ross on her being awarded the Maryland Teacher of the Year. This is such a significant award and I think it should be pointed out that there are excellent educators and staff and leaders in every single school in our district 
And especially, it should be noted that in schools where there may be uh, struggles, that there is still excellent, excellent uh, educators and, and personnel at all levels that give their heart and their all to their students. And I am very excited about her now being in the running for the National Teacher of the Year Award. Um, everyone may remember that we have had one recently, um, recent in terms of the last five years uh, with Dr. Sean McComb. And so certainly Baltimore County Public Schools uh, does have that talent and dedication here. Uh, I also want to appreciate uh, the principals as a parent and also as a board member. I know the incredible and intense role that the principals play, not only as the instructional leaders of their instructional team and the school, but also with all of the logistics uh, and the um, management of the uh, staff uh, and all of the issues that go into addressing the students' needs uh, throughout every day through the whole year. Uh, I also want to uh, acknowledge Hispanic Heritage Month and uh, with my own family members um, and having been uh, had the opportunity to visit a number of those countries, it's really incredible and it's nice to be able to focus on that. Um, I was... Um, you know, really discouraged by the SMOB report um, because of, but I thank you for highlighting uh, the student who applied to a magnet to flee harassment and intimidation at her home school. And that's just heartbreaking because we want every student to feel accepted in their school, in their home school, it's close to their home, their neighbors, their community. and. I will say that there has been work that has been done, but there is much more needed. And so I appreciate you highlighting that. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mack? I've mentioned this before, but I am very fortunate that every day I am able to see and hear students at area elementary schools playing outside at recess. We may be experiencing unprecedented times, but these kids are having a great time just being kids, and it's really, really encouraging to see. I also want to give a shout out to our school nurses. I know from speaking with many of you that your already busy days are so much busier because of COVID, and I don't, I don't think that we acknowledge that enough. I'd like you to know that I appreciate your efforts, and as we move into the budget cycle, I will be advocating for additional resources to assist you in your efforts. Are we doing agenda items too, or are you coming back around? No, we're doing agenda items okay. too. Mm -hmm. Um, for agenda items, I would like an update on the almost 4,000 students who did not access education at all during the last school year. I would like to know how many of these students left the system, how many availed themselves of any summer learning, and if available, how th the remaining students are doing academically this year. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McMillian? Uh, good evening again I'd like to share that the audit committee is going to meet one week from the day at 430 so that's October 19th October 20th is the ribbon cutting at Berkshire Elementary School at 10 o'clock on October 26th is the ribbon cutting at Colgate Elementary School at 930 and and there's also a ribbon cutting at Chadwick Elementary on October 28th that's a Thursday uh, I know that the the recruitment and retention of teachers and staff and and custodians and bus drivers and groundsmen it's it's a crisis and we need at one point I remember the number I think it was 837 that was a couple weeks ago that we had 837 openings within you know 18,000 employees uh, my concern another concern I have are the the people that we have working for us we have a lot of good hard-working people and, and I'm concerned that they're being overworked because of trying to cover for these openings that we have. And I'm really concerned that we're going to lose some of these people that we have that are coming to work every day and have for the last number of bunch of years. So I just, we've, we've, we've got to look out for those people that we have. Uh, in addition to, you know, recruiting, and I might even go to the retired teachers uh, a job in, uh, at Loyola on October 28th. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. 
I wanted to um, just state that uh, going to the Maryland Association of Board of Education's conference uh, last Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday was an amazing experience. Uh, I've never actually attended any professional development things before uh, because I'm obviously only 17, but uh, being there and getting, getting, being able to hear the workshops and being able to hear from our state superintendent and his strong leadership was absolutely incredible. It was so nice to be able to interact with the seven board members that were there and being inter able to interact with, interact with these smobs from throughout the state, learning from them, sharing experiences with them, and talking about how we can enhance student voices in our respective counties. So I want to thank um, all the board members that attended with me for coming to the MAVE convention and I'll pass it on to Mr. Offerman. Or Miss Scott, then Mr. Offerman. It's <laughs> Mr. Offerman. Yes. Yes. Uh, I would like uh, at some point in the future, and it doesn't have to be immediately, that we do get uh, some kind of report on the on the violence or the perceived violence on, on Baltimore County school campuses. Uh, you hear about it in the media. You hear it from people who spoke tonight. Uh, I, I, I'm wondering if there's a way that we can get some kind of quantitative uh, look at this in terms of whether this is just a perception of a problem that you know has grown or not. In addition, uh, after the first term, I'd like to hear some kind of report on, uh, on how our overall uh, student, student attendance ha is going at some point also. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Ms. Pastor. Okay, first I want to again congratulate Dr. Williams on your NAACP award. Uh, I want to say thank you to all of the principals. Uh, I also want to recognize and, and, and very grateful for the contributions of our Latino, Hispanic um, staff members and students and parents and how they, uh, what they add to our school system. Thank you. Uh, to Brianna Taylor, uh, I've seen her teach. She is most deserving of this award. She is an incredible, incredible teacher. Dr. Scriven, I've known you since you were just a toddler teacher, so to speak. <laughs> So congratulations. <laughs> I am so incredibly proud of you as you move on to be the papa bear in a school system, running your own system. Awesome. I am incredibly proud of you. Uh, let's see, for the board members, the um, legislative and governmental affairs will be, committee will be meeting Thursday if you have thoughts about what should go on this year's priority list. Remember, we put that together and then send it to our legislators. The curriculum meeting will be next Thursday, the 21st, 2 p.m. Make sure you get that time right because we've changed it. It's now 2 p.m. So I hope to see you there. To any retirees out there listening, know that that information about our health packet is on its way out. Correct, Dr. Williams, is on its way out there. We've been waiting for a while to get that. And, okay, this one I can't read. So, uh, wait, uh, that's time. Dr. Yarbrough, I'm waiting for that that's professional time. development plan. <laughs> Thank you, because I know you. it's coming. That's time. Okay, uh, Dr. Hager? Uh, I didn't prepare uh, comments. This is my shortest uh, Board of Ed meeting ever <laughs> since I've been on the school board, uh, which I do really appreciate um, that we're ending so early. Um, having said that, I, I do think we, we should ensure there's a balance of content so that we can address things during board meetings that, address, that hit at solutions to some of the issues that we're facing. I know we've briefly touched on busing, um, teacher and staff recruitment and retention, the violence in schools. I know we're having a um, town hall about that, but just uh, I, I would have liked to have seen a little deeper content uh, dive given that we, we did have such a short agenda tonight. As far as future agenda items, I know I've mentioned food service before and it came up during public comment today, but with all the supply chain issues that are happening, I know people are a little bit frustrated with uh, the way that meals 
um, are looking and the options the kids are having. And given that we have a new food service director, it would be great to have an introduction to that individual and hear more about, um, about how things are looking this school year. And then uh, fall testing, I'm sure we're going to be hearing about soon, but that data should be coming in. I know we're to see what that looks like. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn? Okay, I'm going to try and not repeat anything that's already been said. Um, so it's the season to start applying to college. And it's an exciting time, and, it's, and it creates a tremendous amount of anxiety for parents and, and students. Um, you're going to get through it, and it's going to work out. So take a deep breath, plan, and don't miss any deadlines because they don't move. Okay, so, so that's, that's the first thing I'd like to talk about. Check. Um, uh, for, for an agenda item topic coming up, um, today we talked about two contracts that were IT related with significant spend. One increased by eight and a half million dollars. The other one increased by, I think, three and a half million dollars for a total of 13 million dollars. We spend a significant amount of money on IT to support the activities across this large system. Um, what I would like to see happen is we actually sit down and talk about the IT planning and projects that we have in the pipeline so we fully understand what it is um, to, to pull the whole plan together so we understand what all this money is for. And I would um, like to thank the Baltimore Ravens for coming back and winning last night. Thank you very much. And that concludes my comments for tonight. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. And um, for me, I think um, m um, my chair comments pretty much summed it up, but I would um, just like to uh, echo everything that everyone said and um, look forward to, you know, working hard and, and um, moving forward. So with that being said, um, the last item on the agenda is announcements. The board's next hybrid meeting will be Tuesday. Well, will be held on Tuesday, October 26, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. Also, a special meeting of the board has been added on Tuesday, April 26, 2022 at 5 p.m. So, and with that, I thank you all for joining us tonight, and the meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>